So, Joe, the week we start exactly on time, and then people join whenever they join. Okay. Just checking. These are just folks from our office. Nice. We obviously have Kyle and Norman. Lisa is our national affairs assistant. Ezra, who is standing there in the blue and white check shirt, is our uh, communications assistant. And then Ivan's in the corner with your communications director. Oh, excellent. Most of the people on should be attorneys um, who signed up or Good afternoon and welcome to NACDL's webinar, Keep It Confidential. This webinar is, is set to teach you how to encrypt your communications and why that might be necessary. As defense attorneys, obviously, you engage in quite a bit of privileged communication, whether it's talking with your client, preparing documents, talking to your investigators, and the way that security, internet security has changed, the way the government surveillance has changed, may change the way you think about keeping your information confidential. We are set here today uh, with a webinar that's going to be in two components. The first component is going to talk about the perspective of why you want to encrypt your communication. It's going to discuss the ways in which government can actually ask, access those communications, why that might pose some ethical issues for you as a defense attorney. But it's also going to discuss sort of the process from a more industry perspective, from a journalist, as to how you start to make that change. It's definitely a culture shift in the way people communicate. We will then take a pause, a brief five-minute pause. So you will have a moment to get up, get a coffee, do whatever you need to do. And then we will come back. You'll need to refresh your browser at that point. And we will come back and we will hear from the technology point of view, how do you actually go about encrypting communications, sort of the ins and outs of how to get that done. As we move along today, we will be taking questions. But in order to ask a question, you will need to email me. I'm Jumana Musa here with NACDL. And my email is jmusa at nacdl.org. We can repeat that again when it's time for questions, but if you email me, I will be able to ask the questions of our panelists. So today we're starting with two of our panelists. We will start with Jack Gillum from the Associated Press. He is a journalist who reports on many of these issues. He actually has a background in computer science. And as many journalists has, has had to confront the question of how to keep sources safe, how to keep communication safe, and how to be able to do your job effectively in an environment where communications can be accessed. After we hear from Jack, we will hear from Nima Guliani, who's with the American Civil Liberties Union. She is a legislative counsel and a specialist in issues focusing on surveillance, privacy, and national security. She has worked in government at the uh, Department of Homeland Security. She has worked for Congress at a committee level. Um, she is a lawyer as well as a legislative analyst. Finally, when we, after we take a break and we come back, we will hear from our technologist, Harlow Holmes, who is a digital security trainer who is very well versed at uh, taking some of us along who are maybe very new to this technology culture in terms of how to think about these things, how to do them, and how to do them in a way that are not so interruptive to our daily work. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jack. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. So it's funny how just in the you know, the, the short time compared to others in my office that I've been in journalism and how even when I started, it was a telephone and maybe a notepad and something to write things down on. Things were analog. Note cards were kept in a Rolodex. Um, and that was sort of the degree of, of, of encryption and security to some ways is that we would have my filing cabinet would be locked and I would know where certain secret notes were and I would shred them when I'm done. 
but things have changed, obviously, and just like, you know, any investigator, um, anybody who works in law, works in um, any sort of investigative capacity has changed that. We use cloud services. We have iPhones. I don't think I have maybe fewer than 40 apps on my current phone. Um, and we send a lot of electronic communications, and we expect people to have a degree of confidence that when they come to us, those communications won't be compromised. Um, practically, those who use encrypted communications are the people you would expect in light of the Snowden disclosures. It would be journalists who cover um, privacy, technology, national security, sort of in my realm. It would be lawyers who deal with clients um, facing these sorts of charges. Um, it would be also, as as Jumana pointed out, it would be nerds like me, computer science geeks. But to some degree, that's changed where everybody is using encrypted communications, uh, whether they realize it or not. Whether you send an email, um, it might be encrypted. Uh, whether you send an iMessage on your Apple iPhone, that might be encrypted. Uh, it should be encrypted. But the bottom line is that everybody, at least from my perspective in this in this realm, should be using encrypted communications. And it used to be a lot more difficult to do that. And Harlow is going to talk about when she, uh, when it's time when it's her turn about how this used to be a very tough endeavor, and now it's becoming more and more easy to sort of get people on the same page. Um, I personally started making this shift to secure communications for sort of two reasons. The one was the Snowden disclosures was a is a wake-up call in terms of that the government, federal or otherwise, particularly with the AP being in other countries, whether it's Britain, whether it's anywhere else overseas, has the power to look at our communications or could have that power, particularly if they're stored somewhere else, if we put something in a Dropbox, if we make a phone call. Um, but there's also the issue of getting hacked. And I mean, just this week, there was the cyber attack on a major hospital chain in the Washington, D.C. area. I mean, nobody is immune from these sorts of attacks. And I think the more that we try to arm ourselves to be better prepared for these things, we keep our information safe and we tell people that we take this very seriously too. So those two things, I think, in tandem, I can't speak for other organizations, have led the news industry in general to switch more over to a secure way of doing things, um, especially as the tools, like I said, have gotten easier. Um, you know, this reminds me once of, I'm sure you might be wondering, well, look, you know, I, I, you know, I don't do anything national security secret, you know, secretive. I don't really, you know, or a journalist who says, look, I just cover City Hall or I just do this or, you know, I just cover politics. And this reminds me once of after uh, the Snowden leaks came out and a fellow reporter in the newsroom came up to me and said, you know, Jack, this is a lot of mumbo jumbo. Why should I care about getting, you know, getting encrypted? And I pointed out to, you know, say, let's say you get to know somebody over the time on a beat and that person ends up leaking a video that will derail that person's candidate's uh, presidential run, for example, or they say something terrible. Well, if they're sued, those you know people are going to start wondering who who is the leaker of that information so it's it's always nice to be encrypted to begin with because you know then it sort of doesn't really raise suspicion when when you want to if that's your standard practice you know it's unduly burdensome in a sense to you know to all to, to, to change that when you're always using some sort of encrypted communication um and i like to explain to him this sort of this sort of thought experiment is if I was going to meet a source here in Washington, D.C. So let's say I am going to meet a, a good source of mine, um, somebody who's been very reliable, but somebody who's not obviously allowed to talk to me, um, or I don't want other people to know that I'm, I'm talking to. Uh, I will, let's say I call her up on her phone, let's say she works for the government, I say, hey, are we still on for lunch at 1230, at, you know, wherever. Sure, great. I walk from my office, I get on the metro, I get on the subway here in DC, I tap my card, I go through, we have lunch, uh, I swipe my credit card, you know, there's, she, she gets cash out of an ATM, I send her an SMS text later saying, hey, thanks for lunch, it was great. So in this process, I just created a telephone log at the source's government phone, which by the way, the government doesn't need a subpoena to get its own records. Um, there's a transaction of my using a smart trip card, a, a, you know, a Metro Pass card to get in, you know, when I entered a station, when I exited it, um, a credit card transaction, a photo of her at a nearby ATM and an SMS text. If she's not using an Apple iMessage, um, that could, the contents of which could be stored in a cell phone tower. So there's just like, yeah, pig pen from peanuts. There's this metadata trail that sort of follows you around everywhere you go. And it's not, 
it's not a hopeless thing. It just it and, and you might not be able to escape it. Um, but it's it's something to be very cognizant of when you do meet folks. And you know, some folks turn around and ask, "Well, does that mean I have to resort to the old-fashioned meeting at a park bench?" And I'm like, "Yeah, maybe it's nice to get some fresh air. So go outside and talk to somebody there." Um, you can't avoid it, but I think it's very easy in today's modern technology to put everything in the cloud. And I know Nima's going to talk about this a little bit. Um, when you put things in the cloud, whether it's Dropbox because it's easy because you can access it anywhere, whether it's um, any sort of storage to a third party, that means it's a third party. That means there's a third person who has who is potentially has access to this, you know, legally or otherwise. It's in someone else's someone else's home. Um, the hardest thing, and you might be wondering, like if you talk to clients, if you talk to you know other in- investigative leads. To convince people to do this without sounding like you're shady, like, you know, this is a, a you know, because sometimes with sources, if they're particularly scared to talk to me in the first place, they will not, you know, take very kindly to my asking them to install a bunch of different apps on their smartphone to do this. So what they will do is, is they'll, st- if they sense them start getting nervous, I just pretend like this is a standard practice, which is not pretending, it is. I, I tell them certain types of tools to use. I, I, you know, very matter of factly say, well, hey, look, you know, look all the, tar- you know, the hacks with all these co- companies. We just want to keep things safe, right? And this is what everyone does. It's easy. Don't worry about it. Um, and that surprisingly goes a long way. Back again when things were a little harder to to encrypt communications, and you really had to, you know, sit down and spend an afternoon installing software in your computer. I mean, there's a lot of people who felt that a huge barrier to entry and just went, forget it. I don't understand it. I don't want to lose my mortgage. So. Um, it's it's easier to do it now. I just make it a standard practice when I talk with people to use it. Um, some of these tools, in fact, many of them, and Harlow will get into it, are free. Um, and, you, you know, just as a sort of a final note, um, when I was doing some international reporting last year in, in a, a country, I wasn't there, but, but intersecting with a country that doesn't exactly have the best uh, tra- track record of freedom of the press, we have to be even more careful of sources who we talk to there because it's not just their their job at risk it's their their lives as well and it's the things that you take for granted um you know a telephone bridge that we all use to call in on a conference room uh it's a you know a data stored on a hard drive somewhere it's it's firewalls that we use all these sorts of things that if we you know that as we're starting to realize you know could this get somebody hurt if this ended up in the wrong hands even if it means over a plain telephone line, somebody calling and saying, oh, can you go out and talk to so-and-so? You, I mean, that right away might get picked up by 10 different intelligence agencies. So it's just being smart about it. It's not being paranoid. It's I don't think lately anything is paranoia. I think it's Im- important to be realistic, but also to understand that you know your data can be very sensitive and that there are very easy ways to protect it. Um, so that's... From a layman's perspective, that's that's in, in the journalism world, it's been a hard shift at times. And the AP has done a really great job, you know, at least speaking personally about moving us this way. Um, but you know, in industries like journalism, where again you learn to have a pencil and paper and talk to people on the telephone, um, you know, it, it's understandably things can move slowly in a, a digital age to make sure that your encrypted communications are indeed secure. So, um, well, thanks, Jack. You know, in today's world, whether you're a lawyer or a journalist um, or just somebody who has a lot of handles a lot of sensitive information, um, we all communicate um, using electronic devices and using new technologies, um, often without realizing that all that information um, is readily accessible by law enforcement agencies or the government. Um, so, just to give you a few examples from my own professional and personal life, just yesterday, so. I have communicated via email regarding settlement agreements and settlement negotiations. Um, I routinely store briefs and other sensitive documents for my work on my computer. Um, Sometimes I use Google Docs or other platforms to help coordinate efforts with my colleagues um, or with friends. Um, I've carried my cell phone um, when meeting with individuals who may have information about a particular policy area or a particular case. And all of these mechanisms open up um, a certain level of access by the government and by law enforcement agencies 
Um, so my hope today is to talk to you um, specifically about five different ways in which law enforcement agencies and the government can search or gain access to your um, privileged communications or work product. Um, and the hope is that by understanding you know, the nuts and bolts, the, the who, what, when, where, that you can think about how the government um, is able to access this information and take, then take the steps necessary to protect your information um, to ensure that not just you, but potentially clients or loved ones um, aren't inadvertently harmed um, simply because you, you yeah. fail to take the, the steps necessary to make sure that your communications are truly private. So, you know, the first, the first issue I wanted to highlight was border searches. Um, many of us in today's world um, frequently travel to other countries, whether it's driving across the border into Canada or Mexico, um, or getting on an airplane and flying um, to, to Central America or India, we often carry with us smartphones, laptops, tablets, other electronic devices. And many people, what many people don't realize is when you're crossing these international borders, whether it's a physical land border um, or whether you're just arriving at an international airport somewhere in the interior of the country, that Customs and Border Patrol asserts the authority to seize your electronic device without any cause. And so they can take your electronic device, look at it, you know, turn it on, maybe search through um, whatever's on, the, on your, um, your hard disk. Um, but they can also go one step further. In many cases, Customs and Border Patrol have taken a laptop and sent it away to another facility for you know, what they call a, a forensic search, a more deeper search. Um, just to give you an example, there was a case um, a case that's now being litigated where a, bus a Korean businessman um, was traveling through the LA airport. Um, he was getting ready to board an international flight. There, were, there was suspicion um, that he had been involved in potentially illegal activity. And law enforcement seized his laptop. Um, he was not given his laptop back before he boarded a plane. And that laptop was then sent to a processing facility. And in that processing facility, um, law enforcement copied the entire hard disk, um, searched through documents, software, et cetera, for keywords and for information. And, you know, outside of potentially the Ninth Circuit, where there's been some case law, um, to this, at this stage, what but Customs and Border Patrol is saying is they don't need cause, they don't need a probable cause warrant to do this. Um, so what does this mean for, for everyday people? This means that when you're boarding an international flight or you're um, you know, going on a trip, whether it's professional or personal, um, you may want to take extra precautions to ensure that whatever is on your smartphone or on your laptop does in fact remain protected. Um, I will note that there's a lot of open questions about this practice. Um, there are pending cases in, ver in many circuits where people are, are challenging um, this authority. Um, many of these cases have been pending for some time, so we don't know how they're going to turn out. Um, there's also separate questions about, you know, what law enforcement can access from your smartphone or from your computer. So let's say, for example, you have a smartphone and you've got an app, and through that app you connect to, you know, information stored elsewhere. Um, can law enforcement go through and, and look at your Facebook feed? Can they go through and look at um, potential bank information that you may have access through through your smartphone or through your laptop? Um, and those are areas where we don't really have clear guidance from Customs and Border Patrol. Um, there are questions that lots of people have asked. Um, there's also open questions of, let's say Border Patrol asks you for your password. How long can they hold you if you decide not to give it to them? And do you want to be in a situation where you may be waiting four hours or eight hours um, or potentially longer as you're being held while law enforcement you know, searches through your laptop or searches through your information? Um, and so that's one, one area where um, it makes sense to think about what the privacy implications may be of how you travel and with what information you travel with. Um, the second type of search I wanted to talk about was searches where information might be held by a third party provider. So what do I mean by a third party provider? I mean, you know, your email that is being held by, by Google in your Gmail account. Um, information that you maybe use Dropbox for that Dropbox may have access to. Um, information that is in the cloud, maybe use a cloud computing service to, to help manage um, your business and manage your files to ensure that, that you have access to them. Really, police routinely go to these third party providers to request information. You know, we would think that if law enforcement wanted an email, they might come to you and say, hey, please turn over your emails. 
Um, that may happen, but the reality is they may just as easily go to um, Google or Yahoo or another service provider and request that information. And you know, the government's position in legal filings um, has been that when you give information to a third party provider like Gmail, you are voluntarily handing it over. And so that the Fourth Amendment, um, Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. So this is called the, the third party doctrine. You've willingly um, relinquished this information, and so you no longer have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, this is an issue that's been litigated in the courts in a variety of contexts. Um, at least in the Sixth Circuit, um, courts have rejected this argument from the government as it pertains to the content of email. Um, so as a result of this Warshak decision, most providers like Gmail as a matter of practice um, will require a warrant to get the content of emails. But you know, while this may seem comforting, I think that there's, there's still um, the need to approach this issue with caution for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that's a decision in one circuit. Um, we don't know whether there will be litigation down the line that changes that analysis and changes that determination um, and functionally changes the practice by law enforcement and providers. Um, the second is that that decision um, pertained primarily to content. Um, we all know that third-party providers catalog a wide variety of information that goes beyond content. Um, think about what's called metadata, you know, your phone company logging who you called, how long you spoke to them, when you may have spoken to them. Um, the government still, um, still asserts that they do not need a warrant to get that type of metadata and in many cases may get this type of information or other type of information um, with a subpoena or a much lower um, standard of cause. Um, and third, you also should be cognizant of different laws that exist in different states. Um, some states have taken steps to try to protect information held by third parties. Um, this is largely a re in reaction to the reality, which is that our federal laws that govern electronic communications are wildly outdated, um, many of them written before some of you who may be watching this were even born, um, before email existed. Um, and so many states have, have gotten tired of, of dealing with these outdated laws and um, by the inaction by, of the Congress to, to pass updated laws and have decided to pass their own state laws. But these vary. So you may have stronger protection in California than say you do in, in Oklahoma. Um, and that's something to be cognizant of when you think about you know, where you are when you send communications, where your information may be stored, and where your provider um, may exist. The third type of, the third um, scenario I want to touch briefly on is the type of surveillance that's conducted under, um, authorized by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Courts under Section 702 of FISA. Um, this is a program um, that Edward Snowden revealed. Um, you know, under this, this program, in theory, the government is supposed to gather intelligence information. And they're supposed to gather intelligence information about individuals who are located overseas um, and who may have foreign intelligence information. Now, you know, even though the, the program, in theory, is supposed to have a narrow scope, um, from what we've seen disclosed, it actually may touch on a much wider number of communications, um, including privileged communications between attorneys and their clients. Um, so there's a couple of, couple of ways in which this type of surveillance works. Um, the first is that the government um, scans all international communications for specific keywords. So let's say you're talking to your client. Um, and you happen to be discussing someone who is a, a target of foreign intelligence surveillance. That communication may be picked up. Um, let's say that you are talking to your client who is a target of foreign intelligence information. Doesn't mean they've done any, you don't have to be someone who's done um, something that's, that's wrong or um, to be suspected of a crime to have your information picked up. You could, let's say, be a journalist who's talking about drone strikes. Um, you could be a government official who's talking about a national security issue. Um, and in the eyes of the intelligence agency, that may all categorize you as someone who's having foreign intelligence. And so therefore, is, um, you may be um, eligible to be targeted under this program. Right now, um, from based on what's been reported, we know that there are about 90,000 um, targets. Um, if we extrapolate out, think of how many people each of those 90,000 targets may communicate with. Um, and you recognize that the number of people who might be implicated um, by this program is actually quite substantial. And the concerning thing is, is not just that the program exists, but that for attorneys and individuals, 
there are very few protections that exist that are going to protect information from being used potentially against an attorney or against a client. So here's a, a couple of examples. Um, the first is, under the program, privileged communications between an attorney and a client can in fact be disseminated and can be used. Um, it requires authorization from the general counsel, but as long as an individual is not under indictment, there's no bar that would prevent, um, prevent the general counsel from authorizing the dissemination and use of that information. The second is that even if information is not foreign intelligence or someone was not the target of an in investigation, um, their information can be disseminated and searched. Um, and the procedures authorize this if there's evidence that someone um, might have committed a crime. So for example, let's say they were surveilling a target, and as part of that surveillance, they swept up information showing someone may have you know, done drugs. Under procedures, there's nothing that stops the government from then using that information in a general um, criminal investigation or a criminal prosecution. Um, so I raise this to say sometimes you know, we, we think, oh, well, I don't do anything related to national security. I don't have clients who are being investigated for national security reasons. Um, and that may be true, but that's not going to necessarily stop your information from being sucked up under these programs. And that's not necessarily going to stop information that gets sucked up from being used against you or your client um, for crimes that have nothing to do with national security. Um, the, the fourth issue I wanted to talk about was intelligence that happens um, just through Executive Order 12333. Um, again, this is an executive order that came out after the Snowden disclosures. Um, many people were shocked by simply the amount of surveillance that was being conducted simply pursuant to an executive order, um, never authorized by Congress, never authorized by a court. So what does Executive Order 12333 cover? Um, it covers surveillance any time there is information stored outside of the U.S. So for example, when I send a Gmail to my neighbor, um, often that Gmail may transit through other countries or may be served on a server in another country, despite the fact that I'm simply communicating with my neighbor who lives next door and I live in the U.S. And as a functional matter, 12333 has been used um, to gather large amounts of information stored abroad. Um, again, in theory, it's supposed to be used to target um, people who are not um, U.S. persons, but in reality sucks up a lot of communications of people who are domestically in the U.S. Um, just to give you an example of um, two programs that were revealed by the Snowden revelations um, that were being conducted under 12333. Um, one program was called Muscular, um, and that's a program where the NSA targeted um, Google and Yahoo data centers stored abroad, so connect collecting information in bulk from those data centers. Um, another program was called Mystic, and that's a program where the NSA gathered the content of calls into, in and out of certain countries, including the Bahamas. Um, so if you had had a, a client in the Bahamas or you were making a personal phone call to someone in the Bahamas, it's very possible or likely that your, the content of that call may have been kept for a certain period of time by the NSA. Um, these are just some programs that we know about. Um, there's potentially many other programs that we're not aware of um, that capture lots of different types of electronic information. Um, including text messages, um, location information, information about apps. Um, so the, the potential reach of the executive order um, is quite broad. And it's particularly concerning because other, unlike other types of surveillance, um, there is no court process. There's no judge that has to sign off before information is collected. Um, and there's no judge that has to sign off before information is used. So the reality is, if your information is sucked up and used in a way that is ultimately harmful um, to you, you may be very difficult for you to even find out and determine and wage a legal battle to somehow correct the harms um, that might have been um, the result of that surveillance. Again, similar to other types of um, intelligence surveillance, um, there's nothing that stops, um, there is little that stops privileged communications from being disseminated. Um, particularly if someone determines that they may be evidence um, of a crime. Um, so it's just another, another thing to think about um, when you're thinking about the types of information that you may collect from a client um, and the, the idea, the sense that you have of wanting to keep those communications private um, and making sure work product doesn't get in the wrong hands and is not ultimately used um, against you or one of your clients. Um, the last area I wanted to talk about briefly was
location information. Um, this, is, this has been a topic that's you know, come up in the news. Um, what most people don't realize is simply you know, by, by matter of having a telephone, you're creating a log of where, you're, where you are, um, potentially at all times. So for example, um, AT&T has reportedly keeps up to five years of your historical um, cell site location information. Um, that's information about what tower um, your phone may have pinged when it updated your email, um, what sector, the direction you connected to a tower. Um, essentially information detailed enough to give people a general sense of where you are. Um, so if you have your phone with you when you, let's say, meet a client, um, when you're going to a sensitive place, um, that, all that information um, potentially could be accessible. And it's accessible um, in, in one of two ways. The first is law enforcement can go directly to your phone provider and ask for this information. Um, last year, um, um, AT&T received roughly 80,000 requests for um, cell phone location information. Some of that was for historical location information. You know, where was X person? Can you provide X person's location for, let's say, three months or um, 10 months or, or two years? Um, and, you know, in other cases, it was for real time um, GPS tracking of an individual. You know, can you tell me where this individual is right now? Um, because all of our phones are equipped with, with GPS chips. Um, originally, the idea around that was to provide a way for emergency services to be able to find someone if you were in distress. Um, but we now know that what began as um, what seemed like a, a, a feature to provide people um, enhanced, um, enhanced assistance in the case of emergency is now being routinely accessed by law enforcement. Um, so that is one way by going to the provider that law enforcement can get your information. Um, it's important to note that the Department of Justice has taken the position that they don't need a warrant to get your historical location information. So if they want a sense of where you were for the past six months, um, many, many law enforcement agencies are able to get that information with a lower standing, uh, a lower standard um, of showing that they believe the information is, is relevant and material, um, standard under 2703D. The other way that law enforcement, however, can get this information without even going to your phone provider um, are using new de devices called cell site stimulators. Um, cell site simulators are um, increasingly becoming cheaper um, and are available to many state and local law enforcement. Um, and essentially what they are are devices that pretend to be cell towers. Um, so normally if I'm making a phone call, my, my phone might connect to the Verizon or the AT&T tower near me. Um, when I connect, that tower um, logs information, you know, my, the serial number of my phone or other information about my phone. Um, these devices pretend to be legitimate cell towers. So instead of connecting to maybe an AT&T tower, I connect to this device. And once I connect to this device, um, it, it logs the serial number of my phone um, and other information that can allow it to determine um, roughly where my phone is located. And these are devices that were originally designed for military use, um, but we're now increasingly see being, have, seeing them used for general law enforcement. And for what appears is that um, many states and localities are using the, these devices without um, appropriate process um, and without appropriate protections. Um, so you know, the ACLU um, sent FOIA requests to many jurisdictions uh, across the country and found that in many cases, law enforcement were not getting warrants um, before they obtained, they used these devices. Um, they didn't have policies around retention and when information can be used. Um, and that was concerning because you know, the nature of the devices don't just target one phone. It, it impacts every phone in an area. Um, so I might not even be the target of law enforcement, but just because I'm sitting next to someone who is, they may suck up my location information. And it's important to note that um, these devices are becoming more sophisticated. Um, we know that there, um, there are versions of these devices that appear to allow law enforcement to intercept content of communications, um, but we don't have full transparency as to whether states and localities are, um, are using these devices um, and in what, in what capacity is the federal government using them. And so I raise it just to, to raise um, awareness that even when you're using your phone, even in a case where you may have um, a phone provider or um, another company who's acting sort of as, as a buffer between you and the government, um, there does seem to be ways being developed that allow law enforcement to bypass a phone provider completely and intercept information that may be coming going to and from your phone. 
So again, just you know, an extra layer of uh, conscientiousness when you're traveling to a sensitive location or maybe communicating about something um, that's particularly confidential as to, to when you may want to use your phone um, versus another method of communication. Um, and so those are some of the, the types of searches um, and the types of conduct that law enforcement um, are taking right now um, that may implicate um, information stored on a phone, stored on a device. Um, just a couple of other things that I did, you know, don't want to talk about in detail, but I think are issues where people might want to be conscious of um, are the global implications of the way we use technology. Um, as I mentioned and Jack mentioned, you know, many times we're sitting in our house using our phone or our laptop and the information that we're sending or storing may be in another country, may transit another country. Um, and in those cases, or you may be working with a provider who is um, located in another country, um, in which case the, the laws of those other countries might implicate you know, when that information is accessible, when it can be passed to the US government or a foreign government, um, and how it may affect your life. Um, and then the other thing that to remain conscious of is just the changing law in this area. Um, this is one where we've seen the courts sort of lag behind technology. Um, and now we're starting to catch up. Um, and so we hope that the laws go in the right direction and we end up in a place where our emails and where you know electronic medical documents and all those things are afforded a high level of protection. Um, but we can't really bank on that. And so it's, it's good to be conscious of how the law is changing um, in your state um, or at a federal level um, so that you might be able to adapt to changing circumstances based on, on where you are and, and what the law looks like at the time. Forgive me for brief technical difficulties in accessing uh, the microphone. So I want to thank Jack and Nima uh, for properly freaking everybody out. And if you have not <laughs> yet turned off your computer and your phone and you're still with us uh, and not hiding under a space blanket, it is time for questions. So <laughs> if you do have questions, you can email them to me at jmusa at n-a-c-d-l dot org. I'm going to start actually with my own questions, if that's okay with both of you. Um, so Jack, I know you sort of talked about the process of transitioning to this different way of communicating by using encrypted communications and sort of what it took. You, of course, were one of the more security-minded reporters. You report on these issues. You have a computer science background. But what do you think sort of as an industry was one of the most difficult parts of making that kind of a shift? a sort of cultural shift in an agency for those who are not really predisposed, either because they don't work on those things or, you know, they don't think anything they do is that serious. Um, you know, essentially, was there a cautionary tale? Was there a moment? Or was it, is it, has it been more of a general shift? So I, I think this is, this, is an, this is a very good question because this reminds me of, at times um, in news organizations, and this isn't, this isn't necessarily the AP, but just speaking broadly of news organizations I've worked at, and I'm sure this is the case of any any firm or company that, that you might be in too, is that there tends to be a, 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 a tension between the IT side of the building and, say, the operations, or in our case, the newsroom, where the newsroom wants to push the envelope and have all these cool new tools, but the IT folks are like, well, you need to hold off here a minute because you know we, we're, we need to keep our servers up, we need to make sure we, we can support this. and. So I think that can play a lot, a big part in this, regardless of industry. I, I think there can be pushback institutionally, and, and I think, uh, not to agree with it, but rightfully so, I see where they're coming from. Um, as far as, you know, that maybe I had a little bit more of a geekiness to it, I, I think that helped at least to, you know, f you know, ferret out different tools that maybe worked. But what I would do is I would sort of do a, like a small, start a groundswell of support of others in the newsroom, folks that I knew, for example, who worked overseas, who were yearning for, say, a secure form of communication. Maybe they didn't have the, the right words to put to it, like, oh, I want to use PGP messaging. They just knew that they had source A and who needed to talk to journalist B using secure method C. And I think, you know, okay, well, you know, maybe we'll try this. Maybe get them to install this this app. 
do this, uh, you know, whatever you do, don't do this. And once more people started coming around to it and their sources felt more secure, I think that sort of just naturally, you know, you know, through osmosis, I guess, throughout the newsroom, they're like, oh, well, I want to be, I want to know how to do that too, just so I have those tools in my tool belt. Okay, thank you. Um, Nima, you actually gave us a, a very good survey of all these different ways in which communication might be intercepted by the government and, and potentially privileged or incriminating information. Um, I, I did was hoping you could talk to us a little bit about the doctrine of parallel construction and what does that mean for someone who's maybe defending a client. You talked about the shift of things from, you know, where people may think of, like obviously if you're doing a large national security case and someone is you're charged with very serious crimes that you may be thinking this way, but how these things are working their way into the sort of everyday criminal justice system, everyday law enforcement, you know, regular, you know, more run-of-the-mill street crimes, not these high-level, you know, front page of the newspaper types of cases. Um, and so not only the ways you might think they do, but even the ways you don't know they are. Could you talk to us a little bit about what that means and why you might not even know that your communications are being accessed and that may be what led to them tracking your client or um, you know, tagging them or connecting them to a particular plot or place? Sure, I mean, what we're seeing as a, as a practical matter is that even in cases where communications are intercepted um, and even in com cases where you know, those communications or other information are used in a criminal case um, against somebody, um, that there's not always an avenue to one, you know, even be notified and realize that, or two, to effectively challenge it. Um, and parallel construction is, um, is, is one of the ways that that happens. So what is parallel construction? What parallel construction means is law enforcement may get a particular piece of evidence um, through, let's say, you know, an, a particular intelligence technique. And they essentially develop an alternative evidentiary way of getting that information. And so they never disclose, hey, I got this information through this intelligence um, technique using, you know, X provision of law. They say, well, actually, I use this alternative means. Um, and as a result, when you're in court and potentially trying to challenge that evidence, you don't even know that the, this other technique was used to gather the information so that you can challenge the constitutionality or the legality um, of that search or that interception. Um, and a similar phenomenon came up, came up in the context of stingeries, um, which I touched on briefly. But basically, these were devices being used to gather information about where individuals were. Um, in many cases, this information was being um, used as, as evidence that an individual had committed a particular crime. And, you know, there were many cases where this information was used and neither defendants nor their counsel were ever informed that this is how the information was, was gathered. Um, so based on FOIA's um, FOIA requests, we saw emails from the federal government to states and localities saying, you know, when you refer to this information, refer to it as information from a, a confidential source. Um, we saw cases where counsel who maybe had been tipped off that these devices were used um, went to judges and went into courts and said, hey, we want more information about this. And the response from, from law enforcement was essentially, well, we can't provide you, you know, any information. And so I think that we need to be cognizant of the reality, which is that, you know, once the information is, has already been intercepted, it may be too late to actually do anything because as a functional matter, um, you may receive no notice. And as I mentioned, there's this, this, this all false, you know, evidentiary trail that might be created that sort of throws you off the scent of figuring out how this information was gathered. All right. Thanks, Nima. Um, so we have actually gotten two questions that are right around the same type of question. So I'm just going to sort of meld them together, which is, uh, and this is to you, Jack, you talked about that there is a number of different sort of easy tools to use. You mentioned free software. So uh, both questions get to the point of, can you mention some of these things? I believe that Harlow is going to go through some of that. And, and you know how they work, but just some of the tools that you might use that you found um, to help facilitate this kind of encrypted communication. Sure, and, and no pun intended, I didn't mean to be cryptic about that. So um, there are a few different ways, and, and I, I guess I will start with the easiest, or maybe the one that comes to mind most, the most ubiquitous. Um, it is a app, it's um, uh, called Signal. Uh, it is a secure both telephony, so voice and text messaging medium. Um, and it works uh, through a similar service on Android. I believe it's Red Phone, at least for voice calls. Um, I almost exclusively communicate with people that way in other ways. I don't want to necessarily get into how I do that, but um, it is a free download in the App Store. It's great. Um, 
the other method that I have out there is called PGP. Um, I believe it stands for pretty good privacy. It's uh, been around for quite some time. It is a little cumbersome to install, particularly if you say you use Microsoft Outlook. Um, but uh, if you use, let's say if you use Gmail, that basically sits on top of it and it encrypts communications or your emails if the other person uses PGP as well. And there's free software, I, I believe it's called GPG Tools. So it's, not, it's not PGP, but GPG, it's the open source version. Um, if you use Apple Mail on a Mac, I know that it integrates because I use it and it's fairly seamlessly well. And all you do is publish what's called a public key for somebody to get, to download, to install, and then you can communicate securely. So whoever doesn't have that key or that, that, that private key of yours, which nobody else should have except you, when you exchange those messages, it just looks like garbage. It just looks like somebody pounded on the keyboard because they're really mad. There's, there, that's really what it comes across. Um, those are the two most ways. I, I guess maybe another way to put it, if I can say, it's I, I tend to avoid... It, I, I'm very conscious of the services I don't use or things that I don't do. Um, I especially try to avoid calling people at work for no other reason than they're probably not going to say honest things about their boss in their workplace when they're sitting 10 feet from their boss. Um, I tend to go to the bar or the coffee shop when they want to, you know, maybe let loose a little bit and just, you know, relax and have a normal human conversation. Um, I avoid SMS texting, which is, you know, um, you see it on your iPhone if you text it to somebody, an Android user, for example, it's green instead of blue. Um, that can be in the clear. Um, and Gmail now, if you use that, if you notice, if you send somebody a message who doesn't use this sort of built-in encryption called Start TLS, there will be a little lock icon that's unlocked that sort of warns you that if you send this message, it will go in what's called in the clear, so for everyone to see across the internet. Um, it's just being, I guess, particularly careful, not necessarily the tools you use, but just cognizant of what you do and don't, you know, and how that could end up in the wrong hands. All right, thanks, Jack. Um, so in the context of the news lately, this cannot be a surprising question. Um, obviously the most public debate that's been happening around encryption has been the conversation about Apple and the FBI. So in case somehow you all missed it, uh, recently the FBI said they had a telephone from one of the San Bernardino shooters that this was a critical terrorism case, yet they could not access this phone and they needed Apple to break the encryption of the phone so they could access it for law enforcement purposes. Um, just on Monday when they were just about to go to court to find out, and many, many people oppose this for a lot of reasons, um, security reasons, other reasons, uh, the, the DOJ came back and said, actually, we think we can get this anyway. Never mind, you don't need to rule. Um, so that's my, my brief synopsis of the case. But uh, the question is about do either of you have an opinion about the DOJ decision not to try and force Apple to unencrypt or to break into the phone? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I would say two things. I mean, I think one, I would say that this this fight is far from over. Um, the DOJ has, has dropped um, this particular case, but we know that they've sought this kind of access in a wide variety of cases. And so I think that realistically we're delaying the fight. We, we've not avoided it. Um, and the second issue that, that arose from the case is you know, now that there's a vulnerability that the FBI says that they're aware of, are they going to tell Apple so Apple can fix that vulnerability? Um, there's obviously concerns about, you know, if there's iPhone or if there's software that's being utilized and it's not as secure as it, sh as it should be, whether the federal government, not just in this case, but in a wide variety of other cases, is actually informing companies of the best way to patch that. Um, I will say separately, you know, on this issue, um, that you know, I and, and the ACLU is generally concerned about the attempts to force Apple in this case, not just for security reasons. I'm sure a lot of people have talked about how um, you know this you know presents a security threat to everyday consumers. Um, that you know, asking Apple to take these steps would result in, in fundamentally less secure products. Um, but also from a, a constitutional perspective of you know the government forcing a private company um, to make you know, develop software that it wouldn't otherwise develop and which they say is, is at odds with what's good for their consumers. And so um, all of that is to say I, I think that it, you know, while it may be good that the DOJ is dropping um, the case in this particular instance, I suspect that we're going to have to confront that problem down the line, um, you know, relatively shortly. I, I, I cannot take opinions on things, but um, as a reporter, 
All I do know is that I mean, Nia makes a point is that this is not gonna this is not gonna be the end of this issue, and I think it's just a a, a reminder to um, if you are really doing something that you think is secure, just to, or you need to, and you need it to be secure to be smart about it. Um, I I can't tell you how many times that I just go the old fashioned analog way and write things down on paper and put it somewhere if I really don't want it ever seeing the light of day. Um, I, I'm under the assumption, as an aside, that you know any any you know Gmail or Gchat, as they call it, that I type, even if it's so-called off the record with Google, I just assume that anything I type in there will be made public one day. You know, will be in some dump on BitTorrent. I and and again, maybe maybe my paranoia is is a little too much for some folks, but it's just it's important to realize that you know the things that you put into a you know a box might might come out one day, and I just just got to be smart. Okay, so I got another question, and, and this one is obviously, I think, case-specific for the person who wrote it. But the question was, can you point me to any authorities related to the ways in which the government uses cell site information to track individuals? Uh, so apparently in a wiretap warrant, a federal agent had made a comment that the cell site information was not precise enough to track a suspect. Um, and the attorney was arguing otherwise, but I don't know if sure. either if you have... Um, well, I'm not sure that I 100% understand the question, but what we've seen cases, um, these cases are, you can go to ACLU.org and, and type in location tracking, but we have seen cases where law enforcement has gathered historical cell site information um, about criminal defendants, um, locations for where they may have been for the last, let's say, six months or seven months, um, and use that as evidence um, in a criminal case. The Department of Justice, when you know people have raised concerns about getting this information without a warrant, you know one of the things the Department of Justice has said as well: cell site location information isn't that precise. Um, and what we're seeing is, you know, that's not in entirely accurate. As consumers demand um, better service with their phones, um, you know, phone companies are building more cell site towers. Um, so you have cases now where. Um, there's these things called sort of micro cells that you can get in your house and you know they provide service essentially to your house or to a smaller area and so in fact in some cases cell site location information can be quite precise it can be you know the floor of a building it can be a tunnel um, it can be you know potentially um, a bus um, and so I, I would approach you know anybody who says look cell site location information is, is not that precise I would approach that statement with a bit of caution based on what we now know um, and I think that there are lots of cases where we're seeing that information um, being used as evidence in, in, cr in crimes. And so um, that would be the, the best answer I have to that. But again, you can look at some of those cases um, on our website, aclu.org. Um, many of them are cases where um, we've, we've challenged the contact or submitted briefs um, supporting the notion that warrants should be required to get this type of information. Okay. And so I, I do have a couple other questions, but they seem more appropriate uh, for the technology part of our webinar, so I'm going to hold them and just ask each of you quickly if you have any, uh, you know, kind of like an encryption success story or somewhere where you found it to be useful, helpful, um, that you would like to share before we sort of take our break and go on to the next portion of our webinar. I mean, I, I certainly, I think it makes people a little, certainly a lot more confident in what they tell you. I mean, look, I'm a journalist, right? I mean, I don't have subpoena power um, yet, probably never. <laughs> and and people don't have to talk to me. They just, they simply don't. Um, in fact, most oftentimes they never want to see my face and slam doors in my faces. And that's fine. So when you have the rare, the rare person who not only wants to talk to you, but then you really pair that down to the person, he or she, who really like has something to give to you and has taken an incredible risk to do it, it is a, frankly, an ethical and moral obligation, at least as far as my own constitution concerns, is concerned, to make sure that I do that in the most secure, responsible way. And, and you know, my employers, particularly the AP currently, have been very good about helping me achieve that. And when I've led people to secure communications, you know, I, I try to be very calm about it. I mean, I've dealt with sources who, you know, the, the you know, proverbial, like, don't know how to set the clocks on their television sort of thing. But I'm like, look, you know, you download this app for your kid's phone. Can't you just download this one? Oh, yeah, it's no big deal. Oh, this is a lot easier. Yeah, isn't it? And we start talking, and then there's this sort of comfort level, and they know that I'm taking their 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 security seriously. And you know, my my word means a lot. It should mean a lot. It's pretty much the only thing I have in journalism. And I think that there's been some cases recently to the to the question where people who would be un, usually unable 
or really unwilling to talk to me about something sensitive, I think that when I put up that sort of, you know, ensconced sense of like, hey, look, I'm trying to do this securely, uh, that I'm not giving them a false sense of security, but instead that they feel more comfortable. And I think that helps develop a relationship. Sure. Um, you know, I, I would say just along those same lines, I mean, when I reflect on my own use of technology, you know, adopting some of these things was not as difficult as I thought it was going to be. A lot of people might be like me. They're afraid of things that are going to decrease their efficiency. They're maybe a little lazy about adopting new technologies because their computer works a certain way and they like the way it works or their phone works a certain way. Um, and I have to say, when I, when I downloaded you know, Signal and I used PGP and some of those things, um, I anticipated that um, it would be much more difficult to figure out how they worked, and they, in fact, wasn't. Um, it took, you know, a little bit of time, but the investment in the long term so that I can think about, look, am I sending an email or am I sending something that really is um, I'm concerned about getting in the wrong hands, and do I want to, you know, take that extra step and that extra layer of security? Um, and sometimes we think about it here where, you know, it's a bit of a luxury, but when you think about people around the world, there are journalists or activists who you know, literally keeping something confidential and secure is a matter of life and death. Um, and so thinking about, you know, not just how we use these technologies, but how we make sure other people have, you know, the ability to use them, how we make sure that if we're communicating with people who, whose lives may have more sensitivity around their communications than our own, um, that it helps to, to at least have the tools ready to say, look, I, I don't want this person to be compromised because I was too lazy to download an app that provided an extra layer, layer of security. Um, and that at the end of the day, you know, at least as I saw it, it wasn't as difficult as I anticipated. And, you know, if, if I can figure it out, I feel like most people probably can. And, and if I can just say one thing on this point, just to be very quick, I think that, you know, I, I, I'm always a big believer in, in that the process matters more sometimes than the outcome. And that by doing this more and more, it's more than just using a, a tool, right? It's more than just checking the box, you know, oh, I have to use the PGP today. It's that the more that you do this, and we were talking about this all recently, is that, the more you start being very aware, it's sort of this sort of data security state of mind, then I think things ideally start trickling down. You start realizing to be more secure about how you store your passwords, you know, what types of things you're going to put in the cloud, um, you know, what things you're going to tell other people, just because you're, it's in the back of your mind more than just it's like a, 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 a tool that you download and do something differently, like a different walk to work or something. And I think that is, is, is sort of the ultimate and, and helpful byproduct, at least what I've seen in the newsroom. When people do this, they go into it thinking that they want to have like a secure way to, to contact a source, but they end up sort of changing their, their best practices, I think, for the better. All right. Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank both Nima and Jack for joining us. As I mentioned previously, we're going to take a five-minute break, and then we're going to return with Harlow Holmes, who's going to walk us through the how-tos of encrypting your communication. Um, as a reminder, you're going to need to refresh your browser to start up again in five minutes. And just as a small footnote, I will say the American Civil Liberties Union is currently representing NACDL and other organizations in the Wikimedia versus NSA case, which is challenging 702 information collection. All right, we will be back in five minutes.